Hello everyone, my name is Katie and welcome back to my channel. As you can see here, I have new shelves. I recently moved. I did just put up a video last week of me organizing my shelves. If you want to see the process of me organizing these shelves or even have a TikTok of me organizing them, that's like whole minute if you want to watch it i'll link it down below please follow my tiktok i've been making a lot of videos on there it'd be great if you guys could follow along because it's super fun um yeah i joined book talk i feel a little old there but it's fine <laughs> yeah it's always it's always fun to expand to new platforms and and just feel like a noob all over again you know Anyways, today I'm going to be talking about my top 10 books of 2020. The reason that this video is a little bit delayed is because of the move. I just had didn't have anything set up. I moved right in the beginning of January, so things have been a little crazy. But finally, I'm settled in. My bookshelves are up. I actually have three bookshelves, which is beautiful. But obviously, you can only just see two in the frame here while I'm filming. So yeah, I'm just ready to go, ready to talk about my 2020 wrap up finally and talk about my top 10 books that I read last year. However, the first thing that I like to do every year is I like to just give the titles of every book that I read this year. So let's start with that. Save Me, BTS Webtoon, Yona of the Dawn, Volume 1, The Queen's Assassin, The Shadows Between Us, The Stars We Steal, The Notes Part 1, Credence, Haven Fall, Yona of the Dawn, Volume 2, Bone Crier's Moon, The Red Scrolls of Magic, Ghosts of the Shadow Market, Chain of Gold, Yona of the Dawn, Volume 3, The Vanishing Deep, The House of Earth and Blood, By the Book, Missions of Love, Volume 1, Ruthless Gods, The Betrothed, The Jewel Thief, Happiness, Volume 1, Skyward, where Dreams Descend, The Bone Houses, The Princess Will Save You, Children of Blood and Bone, Starsight, Shine, Desperate Measures, My Summer of Love and Misfortune, Mexican Gothic, Laura Olympus Season 1, Learn My Lesson, Majesty, The Faithless Hawk, Yon of the Dawn Volume 4, Clap When You Land, House of Salt and Sorrows, The Damned, Yon of the Dawn Volume 5, From Blood and Ash, Kingdom of Flesh and Fire, Wicked, Torn, Obsidian, Onyx, A Court of Thorns and Roses, Opal, Fortuna Sworn, Restless Slumber, Kingdom of the Wicked, King's Bane, Lightbringer, Princess Ballad, Keeper of the Lost Cities, Playboy Princess, Poison Throne, Keepers of the Lost Cities Exile, A Court of Mist and Fury, and The Girl Who Drank the Moon. So from those, I have picked my top 10. Coming in at number 10 is Mexican Gothic. And this is a horror novel that takes place in the 1950s in Mexico. And it honestly opened my eyes to the horror genre. And I'm definitely looking to read more horror books because I really, really enjoyed this one. Noemi Taboda receives a frantic letter from her cousin who has recently moved to the Mexican countryside with her English husband. And this is so unlike her cousin so Naomi heads to their estate to check up on her cousin. She is a glamorous debutante more suited to cocktail lounges than frozen estates but she is also smart and clever and not afraid. Especially not of her cousin's husband who is an English stranger who is both menacing and alluring and her cousin's father-in-law who is ancient and seems very fascinated by Noemi and not even of the house itself which gives Noemi horrifying visions. Noemi's only ally in this inhospitable place is the family's youngest son, but he too may be hiding something dark. Noemi Taboda, mesmerized by this terrifying house, Noemi may soon find it impossible to save her cousin and escape this enigmatic house. I thought that this novel was brilliantly done. Noemi is such a strong character and we really see her kind of dive into the mystery of the house as she gets pulled under like the vibes were just such great horror vibes like i was terrified yet i couldn't stop reading because i wanted to know what was going to happen and it has such like a cool twist like i don't know i just loved it and it really made me appreciate horror more i really felt like i was transported to the 1950s Me mexican countryside like the writing was just so atmospheric and really set the stage for such a chilling read and the thing with like noemi is she this family just kind of expected her to go along with everything that was going on here but she really did not take anything from them and that's how she was kind of she was drawn into the horrors but like not as much as her cousin because she was so strong-minded and i love the connection that she had to francis even though he was dar harboring dark secrets of his own and the rest of the characters were just like perfectly creepy just like such a perfectly creepy like manner side chilling novel and what's really cool about this one is especially because it's set in mexico it's very different but it's still like a chilling english manner because it is like this english family that's expats from england so it's a very interesting mesh of cultures as well and we kind of get some commentary on 
colonialism and that sort of stuff. It's definitely a little bit slow to start, but I think that it's actually perfectly well paced because the build up is so good to where you get to the point where it's terrifyingly creepy. I like could not put this book down after I got to the halfway point because my heart was pounding. I just needed to figure out like what the heck was going on. And when you got to what was actually going on, like it was just super crazy and wild. And I just really enjoyed my experience reading this book. And I would really recommend it to anyone that's looking to get into horror or if you just want to try something different in general because I was really craving something different than what I usually read and I was not disappointed with this one at all. This next book is actually a book I read not soon after Mexican Gothic and that is House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Craig. And this one is kind of like a YA horror mystery, kind of like it has like horror vibes, but it still is like fantasy, kind of like a, a mix of all the genres. And I decided to pick this up one because it was like similar horror vibes to Mexican Gothic, but two because in my booktube's top books of 2019, this is actually the book that most people said was their favorite. It was actually my friend Keely's favorite, lots of lots of people's favorites, and it was the unexpected winner of that video. So. I knew that I had to read it eventually this year. And I was actually not disappointed. I was pleasantly surprised because I had heard of other people that didn't like this book that much. But going into it with the perspective of like expecting like a horror chilling story instead of more of like a fantasy story, I really truly enjoyed this one. And this is based off of the fairy tale of the 12 dancing princesses. So Annalie lives a sheltered life at Highmore, a manor by the sea, and her older sisters have been dying off slowly. One by one, they meet their tragic end. Each death more tragic than the last. And Annalie is disturbed by a series of ghostly visits, and she is convinced that her sister's deaths were no accident. The girls have been sneaking out every night to balls, dancing until dawn in silk gowns and slippers. Annalie isn't sure whether to stop them or join them, because who or what are they really dancing with? As Annalie becomes more involved with a mysterious stranger that is connected to her family, it is a race to stop the darkness before it consumes her and her sisters whole. Again, this is just a spellbinding novel, I will say. The atmosphere is just set like so perfectly. We have that creepy manor by the sea and then this family with all these daughters that are obviously going through a lot of grief as they keep losing all of their older sisters and it seems like each death is an accident and yet the sisters are kind of dying off sequ sequentially. So it, it is of course no accident. I thought the writing was very beautiful as well. well. That this is like a horror novel but set in a fantasy world. It's like this really cool blend of genres that was just had a really mesmerizing effect. I also just like loved reading about the bonds between all of the sisters. Clearly there's a lot of them, each of them have a special bond, but it was really cool just to see how the family all cared for one another, um, especially through the tragedies that they've gone through. And Annalee is just like so convinced that her sister, the last sister to have died, Eulalie, was pushed from a cliff and she didn't fall to her death by accident. And so she like sets out to find the answers and she's just not going to give up on this grief that is kind of like driving her forward to find these answers because she just knows she just knows that it wasn't an accident anymore. The romance didn't feature heavily in this book, but I still found it to have like some really sweet moments. And it just got creepier and creepier as it went on and gave me chills. And like that's kind of like what you're looking for when you want a book to be a horror book. You just want it to scare you. And I just found that like it race towards like a heart pounding conclusion and I was really satisfied with the way that this wrapped up. So if you're looking for like a standalone YA horror fantasy this is the one for you to read. Coming in at number eight, we have Skyward by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, this is a book I've been putting off for years. I literally got it when it came out and haven't read it since until this year, 2020. And I haven't read a lot of sci-fi, but this book really just like took the cake for me. Like it was just so well done. So Spence's world has been under attack for decades. She lives on the inside of this planet where a few generations ago a spaceship crash landed and now her people have been trying to make their way in the caverns of this planet and they are attacked from above by these aliens that have been chasing them down in their spaceship and now are trying to lure them out of hiding in these caves. So there are these fighter pilots that are the heroes of this planet because they fight these aliens they combat with them in air combat in the sky to ward them off from basically destroying the inner caves of this planet where these people live. So since she was a little girl, Spenza has dreamed of becoming one of these fighter pilots and her father was one. However, her father's fate doomed her because he abandoned his flight mid battle and was killed, leaving Spenza the daughter of a coward and the flight academy does not want to accept her into their ranks. No one will let Spenza forget what her father did, yet fate works in mysterious ways and a discovery in a hidden cavern just might provide her with a way to claim the stars. Okay, yes, I just like love Spenza because she is just like this little firecracker personality and she will stop at nothing. Like she's one of the, the most tenacious characters that I've ever read about. She just like knows that she needs to get in the sky 
to fight and do what's right by her people and she just will stop and nothing to do that and i just really admired her personality and just like there are so many funny moments too where she like her grandma like tells these stories in like very dramatic ways and they're like stories that you or i would know and they become like legends like like maybe like the little mermaid or something like that like so she like talks in like these very dramatic death threats also because she's not that like well socialized with people because she's kind of like an outcast because of everything that happened with her father and it's just like hilarious to hear her threatening people and she threatens people a lot so just like short characters that threaten people like kind of they just speak to me you know i feel that in my soul so i just really felt like i related with spencer a lot also just like how much she cared about the planet and like protecting the people that live there and how she really had to overcome a lot of obstacles to be able to get herself in the sky and do what she she's been born for this sci-fi world is also incredible you can definitely tell that Sanderson has done a lot of research into the physics of space flight and just flight in general. And while the things that he made up are like they're made up, it's fiction, like they definitely have a basis in like real physics. So that was kind of cool, especially someone that like has a science background. I appreciated that that level of detail was put into the plot. Also just in general, like the way that the plot unfolds is crazy like it's really a journey because you kind of are set in this world where these people are just trying to survive and the more you find out about what has happened to them like just the crazier it gets and i will give a shout out to the sequel by um default i pretty much only will include one book per series on this list but like if i include one just assume the other one is included in there if i read it this year and skyward delved further into what's going on in this world and it's just it's so good so crazy and i don't know just like how to explain it but it's just so well thought out and like masterfully crafted and it really made me want to read more sci-fi uh, there are also some side characters that i adore we have an ai called mbot and he's just like the sassiest little robot ai ever i just appreciated his sass at all times he always had these like quick little comebacks and it made the book really funny we also have doom slug just like a slug of death of doom just like really cute and i don't know i just feel like those little touches add a lot to his story i'm really excited to see where the series will go because i just think that the scope of it is incredible and the way that sanderson has been able to imagine this life on this planet and like life in the universe at whole like, there's just so much more going on and this book only scratches the surface of the whole world and there's definitely more of that world building in starsight and I just think it's going to get even crazier and crazier as the series goes on. So I really can't wait to see where it takes me because it's been a journey to read it. At number seven, we have Bone Crier's Moon by Catherine Purdy. I adore this book. I got this book as an advanced reading copy and I immediately had to buy a finished copy once this book was out because I just loved it so much. It is based on the myth of La Dame Blanche, which is also the same myth that serpent and dove is based off but they have completely different interpretations which is really cool and i will say like if you want enemies to lovers where they're like truly enemies trying to kill each other like do not like each other at all until at least like 40 50 percent of the way through the book like this is the book for you because they are literally trying to kill one another for the majority of the book and i i just love that you'll see that's like a common theme on my uh top 10 <laughs> Bone criers have a sacred duty. They are meant to ferry the dead and they alone can keep the dead from preying on the living. However, their power comes from sacrifice. So in order to become a bone crier, the girl must sacrifice her one true love. Elise has been preparing for this her whole life. She is the daughter of the matriarch and so she is preparing to take her place as the matriarch, a particular bone crier's clan but she first must complete her rite of passage. And then we have Bastion, whose father was murdered by a bone crier, and he will do anything to take vengeance on them. However, his vengeance comes too late because now Elise's ritual has begun and has bound their two souls together so that if he were to kill her, he would die too. And thus their fates are entwined in life and in death. Sabine is Elise's best friend and she's never had the stomach for the bone crier's work. But when Elise is taken captive by Bastion, Sabine will stop at nothing to get her best friend back. And this is going to be a duology. Bone Crier's Dawn is coming out in March, I think. I'm so excited for it. Okay, so as you can see, like the the tension is just like phenomenal because they literally are trying to murder one another, like the whole time, or pretty much the whole time. And then as events unfold, like it just gets so good. And I love the whole setup of the world, the way that these Bone Criers have this duty, but. 
they literally have to kill their one true love just like so so good and then we also have of course the bond between elise and sabine which i just really enjoyed reading about that supportive female friendship um you can tell that they just like really truly deeply care for one another and like the lengths that they will go to rescue one another it's just amazing I don't know, if you've ever read a book that's enemies to lovers and you felt like it wasn't slow burn enough, like the slow burn will kill you in this. It will kill you. It's so good. I really felt like this first book was able to effectively wrap up a heart pounding plot because the ending was just like truly insane with what they went through um, and yet left enough threads open for the second book in the duology. Sometimes I find with duologies that they can either be too wrapped up in the first book or they leave too much open that it's not a satisfying ending to like the two book arc but I felt like this really was able to strike that perfect balance of giving the reader a sense of satisfaction after one book but also leaving enough room that that you want the second book you know so like i just i don't know and i read this book like a long time ago and i still think about it a lot so that just makes me like know that it had an impact on me you know coming in at number six is chain of gold by cassandra clare i mean this should be no surprise i am shadow hunter's trash loud and proud i mean look at this cover i um this is the latest in the never-ending shadow hunters world and this is the okay, here we have this cool illustration by cassandra jean the lost hours series which follows the children of the characters from the infernal devices so in order to read this probably best to have read most of the other shadow hunters books but like you should at least read the infernal devices and some of the short stories it's just a very complicated world but i just love it all we follow cordelia carstairs who's a shadow hunter and when her father is accused of terrible crimes her family heads to London to kind of escape some of the steam and preventing the family's ruin. Cordelia's mother kind of wants to marry her off to prevent the ruin of her family, but Cordelia wants to be a hero, not a bride. And soon she runs into her childhood friends, Lucy and James Herondale, and they start to stir up trouble. She heads into their world of glittering ballrooms, secret assignations, and supernatural salons, and all the while she must hide her childhood love for James Herondale, who is sworn to marry someone else. Cordelia's new life is basically blown apart once a series of demon attacks shocks the London shadow hunters. These monsters are nothing like the shadow hunters have ever faced before and they strike everyone with incurable poison and they seem impossible to kill and so London is set into quarantine which is funny this, this came out at the start of quarantine. Trapped in the city Cordelia's friends must fight these demons and figure out what exactly is infecting london i mean it's just cassandra claire goodness wonderfulness like we have such a great cast of shadow hunters characters and i truly adore them all and she just has this ability to make each book in her series have that same shadow hunters baseline that you love but just like create new and unique situations and new and unique characters that just keep you coming back for more and more the plot always just feels fresh like i never feel like i'm reading the same thing over and over again in each of the different series and of course she always just has some of the most beautiful writing there are some great quotes in here and also like the fact that we get like victorian edwardian london is such like a fun time period to explore i mean like hear about london during this time period it's, like i don't know it's just like such a great setting like i just love this whole cast of characters like endlessly and like just cordelia is just brave and determined and lucy has this brightness and this fier fierceness and james is like surprisingly soft and the sprinkle of romantic tension here and there is just like perfectly placed throughout the book to have you rooting for like a multitude of couples even like when it was super subtle i still like loved it i love the shadow hunters series i'm so excited for the next one coming out again in march this year and i mean like i'm shadow hunters trash i think that just encapsulates encapsulates my mood as a whole okay coming in at number five is ruthless gods by emily a duncan this is the sequel to wicked saint oh and look i got this really cool print from the publisher wicked saints serve ruthless gods this is the cover to wicked saints and if you look under the covers of them they're so freaking cool they have like the best gothic fantasy vibe it's just like set in this snow frosted um i want to say it's a slovakian inspired magic system because i said russian inspired one time and my friend yelled at me it was like very up on russian folklore and whatnot okay 
So there are three people that are set on a collision course as their fates are entwined and can determine the future of their war torrens land forever. A girl who has the voice of all the gods in her head, a prince who has assassins set upon him from every corner, and a monster who is parading as a boy with pale blue feeling eyes. And basically they come together to form a plot to kill the king. But it, it is just like, that's such a basic description. It is so much more than that. This is such like a rich and very descriptive world and i'm just like blown away at the way that this all works it's especially this one too like we just get so deep into the lore basically there are these two countries that are at war because they have competing magic systems so it's like an ideological war where nadia's country worships the old god and they have these things called clerics that can channel the voices of these gods in their heads and nadia can hear the whole pantheon of gods whereas seraphin's country where he is the and malakiyaj's country where seraphin is the prince um they rely on blood magic so please just be aware that there is a trigger warning for blood magic um and that kind of like cutting thing for the magic um if that's something that might bother you they basically like have this blood magic that like uses spells and they just like completely disregard the gods so it's interesting to see like what is real and what actually happens when these two magic systems come together and it's got this very um i don't know like what's the best word to use but it has like this very dreamlike feeling when you read it and you just like feel transported that's what i feel like when i read this book because it is, it is so like just like transportive and really just like puts you in that that moment and there's just like so much to think about with like what is real and like there's a lot of unreliable narrator going on so like a character will like think one thing and then like act a certain way and so it's kind of really interesting to see like what is actually going on within these characters heads and just like the relationships between the characters like Nadia and Malakiyaj have this like very complicated relationship and it's so interesting to see it play out because like they're always trying to like outmaneuver one another but also like feelings for each other oh it's so good and then Seraphin oh my god I love a Seraphin he must be protected at all costs I just think the character development is such a strong plot, like point of this series because these characters just go through a lot and they are developed so much and their views and the things that they believe are constantly challenged. And what's really interesting about the way that the story is written is that we only get Nadia's and Seraphin's perspectives. We don't get Malakiyaj's, so it's really always a guess as to what is going on in his head because we only see him through the eyes of the other two characters and perception is really important in this novel. And like the ending of this, wow, just like incredible and i know we all talk about enemies to lovers but can we talk about how this book is enemies and lovers at the same time it is just beautiful that way like their hate and the love for one another is just like so so entwined it's beautiful and amazing it's just a tug of war of feelings and it's just like so yeah, it basically just took everything that worked in the first novel and up to another level. This has a concluding novel coming out in April, I think. And like, of course, I'm going to get it as soon as it comes out because I'm so excited. In at number four is the conclusion to a series that I absolutely adore. I've been talking about the series pretty much since it first came out on my channel and like... The emotional journey that this has put me through is insane. So in the world of Furyborn, there's a prophecy. There are two queens that will rise, a queen of sun and a queen of blood, one to save the world and one to ruin it. And these queens will be marked by the fact that they can wield all seven elements. Riel is basically exposed as being one of these queens when her childhood friend, the prince, is his life is threatened in a public forum and so she uses her powers to save him and so she must put through be put through these trials to prove that she is the sun queen and not the blood queen and then a thousand years later we follow eliana fuera who is a bounty hunter for the undying empire and she basically thinks that by serving the empire even though she knows it's evil it will protect her and her family but that's all changed when her mother is kidnapped and so she joins up with the rebel forces and their stories cross in very interesting and intriguing ways this book and this series just like ruined me because it's so good it's so clever in the way that it winds everything together and like just the ugh, i'm gonna get emotional thinking about it like there's just like so much to unpack with the way that this world works and i just really appreciate this book for having women main characters that are like not likable like like i almost want to say that like these two main characters have opposite journeys and we like always are flipping back and forth between their two perspectives um, but I find that both perspectives are like equally engaging, which keeps the pace of the story going really fast. What I just like love, love, is it explores dark morality in women main characters, and that's not something that we always get a lot in YA fiction. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that, but like, 
it's just so refreshing and a change of pace to like be able to explore this darker morality and like darker themes and topics i will say that this book probably borders on the new adult like if new adult was an actual classification it would probably be classified there but it still has like enough of that why i feel it is classified in ya just like the journey that these characters go through the way that it all wraps up it's just like so clever like you see all these pieces planted throughout the plot of everything and the way it just comes together just like absolutely blows your mind like the only way that i can describe this book is epic in scale and it's so emotional like you know that these characters don't make the best decisions like they're not morally perfect and like i would say there are some of them are morally bad but you still like are rooting for them and like the decisions that they make can make you want to throw the book against the wall but it's so interesting to explore like what happens if like the hero goes bad what happens if like you know like it's just so well done and i feel like this book deserves all of the hype because it is truly just like phenomenal in the way that it deals with that there's like the plot the magic system the world building and just the these two these two women <sighs> just it's just ugh, i get emotional thinking about it okay so now it's time to talk about my top three and i don't think anyone will be surprised with what my top three are if you've been following along in my channel because i feel like these are the books that i've read that i've especially put a lot of emphasis on this year it's so coming in at spot number three is the shadows between us by trisha levenseller this book literally like trisha levenseller has rocketed to the spot of being one of my favorite YA authors. I love everything that I've read by her. I have her on my shelf right here. So we have Warrior of the Wild, super underrated YA Viking fantasy, which is actually surprisingly wholesome. Daughter of the Siren. Oh, these are in the wrong order. Anyways, I'll take them out. Daughter of the Pirate King and Daughter of the Siren Queen. Love these. Like, I'm just obsessed with her. She has a new book coming out in soon. I think in the latter half of this year, maybe like June-ish, May, June-ish. Um, and it's about a woman that makes swords but has like social anxiety. I actually went to a signing for this book and there was not that many people there. Um, I think because it was like the start of the pandemic, but not like quarantine yet. So people were like kind of shy about going to events, but I still went. Um, and I got to meet her and hear her speak. So I just like truly have a lot of adoration for this woman. I just adore her books and this book took the cake for me it's like one of my faves and i have now all of her books that i have are of course signed and she said you would deserve a crown which i do okay so alessandra is tired of being overlooked but she has a plan to gain power one woo the shadow king two marry the shadow king three kill him and take his place so oh it's just like this perfect like fun dark romance because alessandra like is just like she said just like tired of being overlooked so she goes to the court and she does everything in her power to seduce the shadow king to her and the shadow king has like this dark power so he's like not actually able to touch anybody so it's like a very like the sexual tension is just so good and like basically like, the shadow king like has not really retained any like lovers or like potential love interests for that long so but she she knows she has like the power to lure him in and it's just like, i mean look at this cover so pretty it's just like amazing because the enemies to lovers energy in this is just like wild it's wild the sexual tension phenomenal i absolutely just like adore alessandra's character because she like really she's like evil right like she's trying to kill the king to get what she wants and the opening line of this book if this does not commit to grief is they've never found the body of the first and only boy who broke my heart and they never will so yeah and they're both like equally evil and like oh man it's just like a wickedly addictive fantasy. Like I just couldn't put this book down when I first read it. It's a standalone, so it's kind of nice to just have like a story all wrapped up in one, but like, oh man, I adored it. And I just felt like this book was very sex positive as well, um, which I appreciate in my YA fantasy, you know. So yeah, the romance was swoon-worthy and I feel like Alessandra the whole time um, throughout the novel like refuses to be ashamed of being like sexually promiscuous. Very empowering read, so I appreciated that and I just, just love like the badass vibes but also like the i don't know i just freaking adored this book and i love i would say that this is more of like a fantasy romance or like a ya fantasy romance um it's like the romance is the main plot of this but it is set in like a fantasy world so that's kind of how i would classify it but like 
freaking adored it. Coming in at number two on my list is House of Earth and Blood, AKA Crescent City number one. I feel like no one actually refers to it as, as House of Earth and Blood, but this is the first book in the Crescent City series by Sarah J. Mass. Bryce Quinlan is half fae and she basically has the perfect life. She's a party girl by night and works at an antique store by day. She's sailing a long life until a demon murders her best friend and she's left completely bereft and has to deal with all of this guilt and grief and she will do whatever it takes to avenge her best friend. Hunt Alathar is a notorious fallen angel and he's now enslaved to the archangels. His brutal skills have been used for one purpose only to assassinate his boss's enemies. But with a demon rat wreaking havoc in the city, he's offered a sweet deal if he helps Bryce find the killer and his freedom will be within reach. And as they dig deeper into the city's underbelly, they discover a power that threatens everyone and everything that they hold dear. Okay, Sarah J. Mass does it again. I love Sarah J. Mass. I thought that this was such a great first novel to set up her like adult urban fantasy world because this is kind of like a fantasy, completely fantasy city, but has modern technology in it as well, which was really cool. Like there's email and like phones and stuff like that, but yet like their power runs off of like people's magic. And we have like, of course, all manners of different creatures, which is really awesome as well. So I think that the foundation was laid really well for a very, very cool world building. And we have the four houses here of the world. This is like the map of the city and it's just like so expertly done. The friendship aspect and the fact that like this revolves around a girl who has lost her best friend it just hits so hard it's, even though that loss happens in the beginning of the book you really see their friendship build up and it just it hurts so bad when it happens it hurts so bad when it happens and then it's really a book about dealing with grief and we kind of see like bryce's inner journey as she deals with her grief but also hunts kind of he's also dealing with the fact that he's like enslaved to these archangels and i just thought the plot was so smart um, the way that it all comes together in the end and like the action was so good, so fast paced and there's just like so much to explore with this world. The world building is very detailed and I have so many theories about where this could go and I love when a book has enough de like, details in the world building and like lays enough of a path for you to start to think of different possibilities of how it could end up and Sarah J Mass is just like such an expert at doing that. So I'm really, really curious to see where this is going to go. And especially because Sarah J Mass's series tend to have like big tonal shifts in them. So like think of like the difference between Akatar and Akamath, like how we have that huge switch in basically like what's going on and kind of like in between Crown of Midnight and Air of Fire, there's like a big change in kind of like the way that the story was structured. So I'm interested to see like what kind of twist will also come to this world that we, the way we built up the story and stuff like that. I could see it going like a multitude of different ways. And just when there's just so much involved in the story, like I truly adore it. And I love this book. I think it's a really great way too for YA readers to get into a bit more adult fantasy because it is more on, it is on the adult fantasy side, but it is urban fantasy kind of. So it's like a little bit easier to get into. Um, just like kind of be aware that in the beginning you are inundated with a lot of world building facts but like for me that doesn't bother me i like to learn about the world in the beginning but there's just some differences between like ya and adults that you just have to kind of in mind when reading this but like yeah i could talk about this for hours i just adored bryce and the way that she like cared so deeply about everyone and there's just so many like emotional moments that killed me in this book and like i just loved it i just loved it and, like the so many ugh. i feel like i'm definitely gonna have to do a reread of this before the next one comes out because I adored it. And I also have this really cool tour edition that I was able to snag um, when they put them on sale on their website after the tour was canceled, so love it. Time for number one, drum roll please. My number one book of the year is From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. I don't think that anyone would be surprised. So this is my number one book of the year because I've talked about this book endlessly on my channel. It's just so good. This is Jennifer L. Armentrout's first crack at high fantasy and she's doing a phenomenal job at it. Um, in this book we follow a maiden who is chosen from birth to usher in a new era. Poppy's life has basically never been her own. As a maiden she cannot speak to anyone, she cannot be seen, she has to wear a veil whenever she goes out in public. She's really just supposed to like exist and not experience like anything and least of all like pleasure obviously because maiden she's waiting for the day of her ascension but she would rather be out with the guards fighting against the evils that threaten her kingdom but she has never had 
this choice. Enter Hawk, a golden-eyed guard who is honor-bound to ensure that Poppy lives to see her ascension, but he incites her anger and makes her question everything that she has ever believed. And then forsaken by the gods and feared by mortals, there is a fallen kingdom that is rising to power once again. And as the shadow of the curse draws closer, the line between what is forbidden and what is right becomes blurred. This is definitely a new adult fantasy romance. Um, so definitely like 18 plus. It just has everything. Action, adventure, spice, feelings. Like I could just go on and on and on about this book. I will say that again, it is a book that is very sex positive because we are definitely fighting against this idea of the fact that like someone needs to be like pure to be like known for their their worth and also kind of really takes a stab at the fact that like virginity is a construct that is like upheld to control women because poppy is basically like controlled through beating this maiden and needing to remain pure but there's like you know like no actual reason for why she can't like have sex you know it's just that they have this whole like maiden thing going on and it's so interesting to see like how she suffers as the maiden and oh my god the world building is insane because this incorporated a lot of different creatures from like paranormal fantasy worlds that you don't normally see in high fantasy and made them high fantasy creatures so that was really freaking cool and really interesting to see and i was not anticipating that those kinds of creatures were in this book so when i figured out what was going on i was shook there are so many plot developments that I did not see coming that I just truly enjoyed and at the heart of it all I just really love Poppy and Hawk's story and like how they're able to come together and I don't know I just like swoon and like it's just so emotional but like I love it and like I honestly read this so fast I actually read it on my kindle and when I saw the page count I was like did I accidentally buy an abridged version of this book because I feel like I read this so fast for like a 600 page book but no I didn't it was just that good that I could not put it down and it's quickly become one of my absolute favorites and it made me want to read everything that Miss Jennifer L. Armitrout has ever written and of course the sequel A Kingdom of Flesh and Fire just as good just as amazing it has so many tropes that are like tropey that I love but like just makes them fresh and unique and like oh I don't know I just I'm absolutely in love with everything about this book. I love it forever. I feel like it is super hyped up on TikTok. I don't see it necessarily talked about as much on booktube yet, but I definitely think it will be making the crossover. But yeah, like every other TikTok that I see is about this book. And for a good reason, because it's just chef's kiss amazing, like completely captured by heart. I love this series. I want to reread it already. The third book comes out in April, and the first two books that are like 500, 600 pages each were... Both released in 2020 because Jennifer L. Armstrong is a writing machine. I'm not sure how many books are going to be in the series total, but I will eat them all up. I am so in love with this world and just the character. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. And there you have it, the top 10 books that I read in 2020. Let me know if you've read any of these books down below in the comments or just leave a little heart if you've watched this far. I feel like I am really satisfied with the books that I read this year and I can't wait to just continue reading what I love in 2021. So with that being said, have some fun, read some books, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.